continue our Me But Free series looking at the life of Jonah. We're going to finish Jonah's life today, and next week we're going to look at the life of Moses. And we're going to talk about unfinished endings today, that sometimes it doesn't just finish with a bow, but it doesn't mean it isn't beautiful. And today is really the big aha moment in Jonah's story. For those of you who don't know, quick review of the book of Jonah is it's a book in the Minor Prophets of the Old Testament. Uh, he is an Old Testament character. Some of you, you, before we started this series, you thought, Jonah's pretty good. And now I see some of you in the hallway, and you go, actually, and you look around, you don't want anyone to see you. And they go, Jonah was actually kind of a jerk. And you're like, yeah, I know. But Jonah's a mirror, remember, to our lives, and oftentimes how we can treat others, or even how we see God. And so in Jonah chapter 1, the word of the Lord comes to Jonah's life, and he does something really foolish. He tries to run from the presence of the Lord, and he goes in the opposite way to Tarshish. And from there, calamity ensues. He creates his, his disobedience, as our disobedience does, wreaks havoc on those around us. It's what we can see in the life of Jonah. His life goes down, down, down. And then finally, God appoints a fish, which doesn't seem like grace, but it is grace. He appoints a fish to swallow Jonah. This fish, I don't like how the, some of this, the translations, um, I don't like how they sanitize it a bit. It says it spit him up. No, no, no. It absolutely vomits him on the land. I think it's a better metaphor. I think it's exactly what our lives look like at times. But he's at least now going in the right direction. So it says the word of the Lord comes to Jonah the second time. Again, chapter one, it says that he flees from the presence of the Lord. And by this chapter, it says that he's obedient to the word of the Lord. But there's an amazing dichotomy between these two things. He's being obedient to the word of the Lord that's come to his life, okay? So he's doing what God said, but he is still not wanting to be in God's presence. There is something intimate about being in someone's presence. You can be sitting with someone and you're there and you're engaging in conversation, but you're not there in heart. You're not in each other's presence. You're more just listening into what each other, it's, it's a different, different animal. And that's how God, that's how God, or Jonah, I should say, is interacting with God. Jonah's problem is something that I guarantee you as a follower of Jesus, I guarantee you, you're going to have in maybe a season of your life. There are some of you here listening today or watching online that there's a disappointment that you have that God, God zigged when you wanted him to zag. That you answered, you asked God for something and he said no. And in the gap between where that is, where you are and who God is, there's disappointment, there's stuff. That's where Jonah's heart is. And so last week, here's where we left in Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. And before I read it, here's what I want you to hear with both ears and your whole heart. You know you're playing on the devil's playground. You know you're in the enemy's playground when these two words apply to how you view God, unfair and unjust. You just know you're on the devil's playground. You know you're on the enemy's playground because the enemy from Genesis 1 all the way through Scripture simply distorts who God is. It's the same consistent lie over and over again, but it's so appealing to us because that lie often forms with how we believe God should be. And so we're susceptible to it all the time, and so is Jonah. And so Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 says, this is last week, we're just going to pick up right there, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, here's what he said, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country. Now, there's nowhere recorded that Jonah says these things, but this is the aha moment. Now he's gone to Nineveh. He's preached the worst sermon on the planet, and God's actually used it. The Ninevites have repented of their sin. Even the king repents of the sin. They're turning to God. They haven't got rid of all their other gods as well, but they're turning to God, hoping to relent disaster. And here's what Jonah says about God. It's not who he wants God to be. This is what he says. When you hear what he says, this is the core of his problem. I think these are actually really good things about God, but we'll see why it's a struggle for Jonah. For I knew that you were gracious, a gracious God, merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Turn the person beside you and say, that's not so bad. I knew. I knew. This is why I went to Tarshish. I knew this is who you were. I knew that you were a gracious God, that you were merciful, that you were slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And then, of course, and that you're going to relent from disaster. That's a clue. God, I knew, I knew that these Ninevites who don't deserve any grace, 
compassion, mercy. They deserve to be wiped off the planet. Remember, the Ninevites were cruel. They had been preying on the children of Israel. There's justifiable hate between these two groups. So even God asking Jonah to go minister to the Ninevites, for Jonah is unfair. This is Old Testament. This is not New Testament. This is cause and effect. We begin to see the shadows of God's heart. And so for Jonah, he is struggling deeply with God. I can't see why he would be merciful and gracious to them. God, I can't see why you would relent from disaster towards their life. And then he says, therefore, O Lord, here's what Jonah says. Please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. To the person beside you, go, a little dramatic, Jonah, a little <laughs> dramatic. Jonah's what psychologists would call a super feeler. A little dramatic. Oh, Lord, please take my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. Doesn't that sound like the opposite of the gospel that Jesus preached? That if you actually want to live, you got to die? Not physically, but die to ourselves. You've got to die to those things. And Jonah, what's jo- Jonah's struggling to die to the things of his own heart and his own life. And I can identify with that. If you can't, you're not breathing. Jonah is wrestling with all of these things. And again, finally, Jonah's heart, his honest heart, reaches his lips. Here's what I want you to know. Sometimes it takes a storm and a season for your honest heart to reach your lips. And Jonah's been through some stuff. He's been on a boat that almost felt like it was getting ripped apart. He's been cast over. That saved the mariners, but he's been in the belly of a fish, spit on a dry land, and now here he is in Nineveh. And what he's dreaded the most is not, not the boat. What he dreads the most is not the fish. What he dreads the most is God being gracious to people he deems to have no value, worth, or any way in which they should be given grace. And so he says, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. And here's what's true of all of us. Here's what's true of Jonah and why he is still a prophet who speaks to our lives today. You will in your life experience a gap between what you want God to do and what God will do. And in that gap, you are going to be tempted mightily to create a God of your own understanding, to create a God that you can control, to create a God that fits your world view. In that gap, That's what Jonah's wrestling with in the gap of those two things. Now, we don't often in 2019 talk about Ninevites. But we express these frustrations in words and sentences like this. When we're here and life happens here and we don't see God here We ask questions of God like this. If God is so good, why is there so much suffering in the world? So we want freedom and autonomy in one sense. But we also want freedom and autonomy from the consequences that our freedom and autonomy creates. And when it creates brokenness, we say, well, God, if you're so good... If you are so good, then why is there so much suffering? Because because I can't see that you're good when I look at all these things. If God, if you would allow X to happen instead of Y. God, when I prayed for healing and they died. When I stepped out in faith and I fell flat on my face. God, when I trusted again here and felt like I was burned here. God, in that place, we will be tempted, did God really say, to create a God that we can control. 
to define God by our circumstance rather than by his forever defined character. This is the challenge. If God is so good, I cannot reconcile a God that is good and an eternal hell. These are questions that our culture is asking, not what about those Ninevites? Has no context to us. But essentially, it's the same gap. It's the same struggle. It's the same place Jonah found himself, which is this. God, I can't see that there's any justifiable reason for you to be gracious to them. Therefore, there isn't any justifiable reason. And if you've ever followed Jesus long enough, you will go through seasons and things will happen and you will have experiences and it'll feel like unanswered prayer or it'll feel like God is no or it'll feel like you go through something in life that challenges who God says he is. That the gap between where you are and who God says he is and in that place, you will and I will be tempted just like Jonah. Jonah has a Proverbs 26 problem. We have Proverbs 26 verse 12 problems in the gap. Here's what Proverbs 26 verse 12 says. Do you see a man or do you see a woman that is wise in their own eyes? Do you see a man, do you see a woman who is wise in her own eyes, in his own eyes? There is more hope for a fool than for them. Turn the person beside you and say, you fool. There's more hope for a fool than for them. Do you see a man, do you see a woman who is wise in their own eyes? We, created individuals, have to have humility when dealing with an infinite God who knows the beginning from the end. And when we can't reconcile, when we can't reconcile in a moment, can we trust that he is the same God who promises to redeem it's not easy for any human being in these spaces. And so before we get all judgmental on Jonah, I just want you to know that I is Jonah. And so are you. Maybe not specifically. Here's a great question. Who do you hold unforgiveness towards? Is there a group of people that you hate and that you believe if they didn't exist, life would be better. You know, we'll talk about it in a few weeks after Easter, but we're, we, we're talking a lot in, as Canada about tolerant, but we're, we're, I don't know if we're becoming more tolerant as we are becoming more polarized and deceptive. It's different. We talk at each other now. I'm not quite sure we're knowing how to talk to each other right now. We got blame on all sides. So this can be a left or a right issue. This can be a religious group or a this group issue. We can justify our hate in a lot of different ways, and we can find ourselves justifiably commendable by our own echo chamber, but the scriptures will convict us and say that we're in sin. And here's, so, so who's your Ninevite? Who's our Ninevite? This is where the rubber meets. This, this series is about freedom. So I, I wish I could just like dance and make it all like, well, I don't wish I could dance. Nobody wants to see that ever, anytime. If I go to your wedding, I'm the guy who holds up the wall. It's all good. I'm just making sure it doesn't fall. But I wish we can go try it. But here's the thing. When we're talking about a series on freedom, it's actually Dr. Jesus coming in and pushing on things and saying, does that hurt? Anybody ever been to the doctor? Yeah, I got, a, I, got a, I got a bad boot. Like, my foot's killing me. And they take it and they go, oh, does that hurt? Yeah. I'm just trying to find out where the pain is. Sometimes you got to push on the pain to find out where it is. So today we're going to push on a little bit of pain, not to be ungracious, but to actually be loving. And it's not me. I'm no expert. This is, the Holy, this is God's word pushing on all of our hearts, the Holy Spirit pushing in. And so for Jonah, here he is in his view of God and his view of others. It's diminished through all the storms he's gone through, but you can see it's, it's not been destroyed. Notice Jonah chapter 1, 2, 3, and 4, that God is being gracious and compassionate, 
slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And when Jonah is thrown overboard, the God of heaven relents from disaster, though he deserves all of it. And so Jonah is receiving who God is, but he's not willing to let that same God be that God for the Ninevites. He's struggling in that place. For him, it feels unended. Jesus told a familiar story in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 to 35. And I'm doing my best just to read it and not stop and preach on any point. I'm just going to read it. So help me, God. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed 10,000 talents. Turn to the person beside you and say, that's millions. That is a lot. And since he could not pay, nor could he ever pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and his children and all that he had. Did you notice that hit one person's disobedience has a ripple effect just like Jonah's? Same story, okay? Same idea, same heart. Uh, so that payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me. God is what? He's patient. I'm going to keep reading, sorry. And I will pay you everything. Now, he couldn't ever pay him back, so I'm just going to highlight that and keep reading. And out of pity for him, the master of the servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when the same servant, everyone say the same servant. The same servant went out. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, so a whole lot less. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So, he, he, so his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him. Same words that he just spoke a moment ago. Have patience with me, and I will pay you. And he refused, and he went and put him in prison until he should pay his debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they said, and they went, excuse me, they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, uh, you wicked servant. Turn the person beside you and say, that's not very encouraging. Is it true, though? Is it true? Remember, God is the God who is 100% gracious, and he's 100% truthful. He's not a some combination of both. God is the God who absolutely loves sinners, and God is the God who calls sin, sin. He's 100% both. You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? Should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had had mercy on you? And in his anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt, which he could never do. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your what? From your heart. So in both stories, we're invited to see the difference between our human hearts and the heart of the Father. In both stories, God is trying to address all of our Proverbs 26 verse 12 perspective problem. That just because we can't see something as just doesn't mean there's no justice. Just because we can't see what God, is not, what God is doing. Just because we can't see God moving doesn't mean that he isn't moving. And the human condition in its brokenness is wired for revenge, not redemption. And that's not something that plagues some of us. That plagues all of us. All of us are one circumstance away from it surfacing in our hearts and in our lives. And Jonah has been disobedient, but God has been so patient towards him. Jonah's decisions cause storms for others, and God has been loving towards them. And again, everything that God has been towards Jonah, he receives. But when God chooses to pour out grace on those who Jonah deems not deserving, his back goes up, and his view of God now begins to change. It begins to strain and there's a struggle within it. And how does God respond to Jonah as Jonah pours this out? I knew that you were going to do this. I knew, I wanted you to wipe them off the face of the earth. And I knew that you were going to be gracious. I knew that you were going to relent. I knew that you were going to do all these things. And it says that he's exceedingly mad. Jonah's furious with God in this moment. Now, here's what I would say on Jonah's behalf. At least he's praying honest prayers. 
I'll take that a thousand times over to some religious prayer that's mouthing somewhere where our heart isn't at all. I'll take that over false and piety and nonsense, religious gobbledygook. I'll take the mess of his heart, the true mess of his heart, over the inauthentic expression of worship any day. So that's the thing he's got going for him. But he's furious. And the Lord says to Jonah, do you do well to be angry? Now here's what I want you to know. When, when God asks you a question, he's not, he already knows the real answer. The God who knows the beginning from the end actually still knows that. He's not all-knowing if he doesn't know that. So when God asks Jonah, do you do well to be angry? It's not for God's benefit, it's for Jonah's benefit. Do you do well to be angry? And I want you to think about Jonah. I really want you to put yourself in his shoes this morning. I want you to think about Jonah as a child watching the Ninevites ransack his community and people slaughtered in front of his eyes. It's easy in 2019 looking back on... <laughs> Sorry, Nat, I'm going to stare here. It's easy. But this is Jonah who's seen a lot of stuff. How many of you know it's very easy to look at what else someone else is going through and to judge them by their circumstances while we expect others to judge us by our character? And here's Jonah in this place. God says, do you do well to be angry? Timothy Keller says it this way in his book called The Prodigal Prophet, all about Jonah that you can pick up. We've pulled from it. It's been a great resource helping us teach through it. One of the reasons we trust God too little is because we trust our own wisdom too much. We think we know far better than God how our lives or life should go and what will make us happy. We call that, we've called that this morning, the Proverbs 26 verse 12 issue, that we trust our own viewpoint, which creates a very small worldview. So Jonah's furious with God. And here's what I want you to know. Again, he preaches the worst sermon in the history of the world. And God uses it. So if, if you ever feel like, well, I could never be used by God, look to Jonah's life. He, did, he preached this the worst sermon and God uses it. So you could even preach David in the lion's den and it'll work. Some of you are new to church and you'll discover on your way home, wasn't it Daniel on the lion's den? Yes, it was. I preached one time all about Moses, but I was telling Abraham's story. <laughs> and guess what? Someone gave their lives to Christ that night. <laughs> so you walk away going, not really about what I do. But it is and that we have to be obedient. And God can redeem our stuff. So here's Jonah, right? He preaches the worst sermon in the world. And all of Nineveh, including the king, begins to repent. Here's what happens. Listen, listen. They repent, but they still don't know who God is. This is the time for the prophet to stay in this place and unpack who God is. This isn't the end of God's move. It's the beginning of his move. But Jonah's exceedingly angry with God. And it says he's so angry. It says Jonah went out of the city of Nineveh. And he sat to the east of the city. And he made a booth for himself there. He made a booth. This isn't a kissing booth. This is like a booth where he wants to sit. And here's what the scripture says. He sat under it in the shade. So he puts the booth in the shade till he should see what would become of the city. Jonah makes himself a booth outside the city hoping that God is going to see it from his perspective and wipe out Nineveh. He's just waiting. Smite him. Almighty smiter. It's what he's praying. He's got a front row seat to their destruction. <whistles> Although they probably didn't have watches, but the big sundial on your wrist. <laughs> Back then, I'm probably still like, I got a Gucci sun. I got a Gucci sundial. Who you got? Mine's just rock. 
I don't know where that came from. Mm -hmm. So now the Lord, watch this. So the same God who appoints the fish appoints a plant. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might shade over his head to save him from discomfort. Turn the person beside you and go, oh, that's lovely. (laughs) And it says that he was exceedingly glad because of the plant. Exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant. Tell the person beside you, that's just mean. (laughs) God appoints a plant that gives Jonah shade and comfort. And it says that he's exceedingly glad. All of a sudden it's like, okay, now, now, now you're the God that is good. And God realizes, "Uh uh-oh, you're trusting in the comfort of earth and not the creator of heaven. And so he sends a worm to eat the plant. And it withers, the scripture says, that it withers. So then the sun rose. Now watch what God does. He is so mean to Jonah. God appointed a, (laughs) I love the descriptive word here, a scorching east wind. Couldn't you have appointed a gentle east wind? No, a scorching east wind. And the sun beat down on the head of Jonah. And the very thing that God provided for his comfort, he pulls away. And it says that when God touches him and makes him uncomfortable, Jonah basically says, you're not God worthy of my worship. The actual words are, He asked that he might die and said, it's better for me to die than to live, which again is the opposite to the gospel. The gospel is we die to ourselves, we live in Christ. And Jonah is essentially saying, "Uh uh-uh, if this is who you are, no. God is good as long as things go for Jonah the way that Jonah sees they should go. But when things aren't good, God is no longer good for Jonah Can you not identify with that struggle in life? If you can't, I'm telling you, you're not breathing. You're not being honest, maybe. Or maybe you've never gone through a dark night of the soul season where things are tested to profound places. How does God respond? God responds with the same kindness towards Jonah with a question. But God said to Jonah in Jonah chapter 4, verse 9, Do you do well to be angry for the plan? So first of all, do you do well to be angry for the people whom God loves and created? And Jonah says, yeah, exceedingly angry. Do you do well to be angry for the plant? that God created, that Jonah didn't create, that God created. And it was a gift that he gives and sometimes takes away. And I watched the unfinished ending to the book of Jonah, but see the heart of God. And the Lord said, you pity the plant which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow. And everyone said, that's true. He made a booth, but he couldn't make the plant. So this is sheer grace. Jonah can't do this to deserve it. Which came into being in a night and perished in a day. Now you should begin to think about New Testament that says all of our lives are but a vapor. Here today, gone. Tomorrow, created, not creator. And so he says, you do well. You pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make grow, which came into night and perished in a day. And here's the heart of God. Here is the beautiful love of God. Should I not pity pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, dot, 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 and also much cattle. And all the cows said, amen. (laughs) 
this is powerful. Luke chapter 19 says, for the Son of Man did came to seek and to save the what? Those of you who are churchy, you know the word? The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. Everyone who does maybe don't know the word, the word is lost. One, two, three. The Son of Man came to seek and save the lost, not the wrong. Our wrongness stems from our lostness. God is not letting Nineveh off the hook here any which way. He's going to the root the same way he went to the root of the plant. He's going to the root saying they're lost. Their worldview, Jonah, is the same as your worldview. They just do what's right in their own eyes, but they're not trusting that there's a greater perspective. They're both plagued with the same syndrome and problem. And God says, I pity them. I have compassion. My heart is open. My heart is broken because they don't know their right hand from their left hand. They're lost. They need to be found. And they are found by a God who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. They are absolutely dead to rights in terms of justice before God, but they meet a God who is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah is dead to rights in his disobedience between God, but he meets a God who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love in the smack middle of the Old Testament that so many of us say, I like the New Testament, Jesus. I don't like the Old Testament, God. Don't do that. He is the same yesterday. Yesterday, today, forever. This is progressive revelation. And so here's what I'm saying to you this morning is in the gap between where you are and what God does, in the gap between what your life is and who God has declared himself to be, in that gap, don't ask for a Jonah. Be grateful that God sent us his son. And we, when we see the world, when we see our circumstances, when we see through the lens of who Jesus is, we begin to see the fullness of God's heart. Aren't you glad that Jesus is our better Jonah? He is our better Jonah because he preaches. Jesus preaches repentance, but he does so with tear-stained eyes. Jesus is our better Jonah because he came to seek and save the lost like Ninevites and like you and like I. He is our better Jonah. Jesus is our better Jonah because he alone exchanged the comfort of heaven for the cruelty of a cross. And he did it to those of us who are least deserving of it. Because the same God we see in the Old Testament who is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love is the same God nailed to a cross, creator subjecting himself to creation, saying, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The same character in nature. And so in the gap between what happens and who God is, it is imperative that your worldview, my worldview, is not shaped by our thoughts, our feelings, our thinking, and our emotions alone, but who God's word has forever declared God to be. Otherwise, you're building your life on shifting sand when you were purposed to build your life on a foundation that is unshakable, on a name that remains above every other name, including the name of cancer, including the name of suffering, including the name of injustice, including every other name that we can fill this gap with. So in conclusion today, why does God allow all the suffering in the world. Why do we pray for X and sometimes get Y? Why in the world is a God that is supposedly so loving create a place called an eternal hell? Why? Close all those loops. And what I'm saying this morning is no. In that place of unfinished endings, here's what I know. I can't give you every reason why God zigs when you ask him to zag because I'm not God. And anybody who claims to figure out all that, all I would say is one piece of advice, back away quickly. Because if we create and we have a God where we take all the mystery and all the eternal, knowing the beginning and the end, and we pull it down into something that we can hold, I'm telling you, we've created a God that we can control who's no longer worthy of worship. Mm -hmm.